Well, thank you very much to the Newmans for uh, reading for us. Uh, if you were with us over Easter, you, you may remember that we looked at the account of Jesus on the road to Emmaus, how he came alongside two travellers uh, and rebuked them, saying, how foolish, how slow you are to believe that all that the prophets have spoken. And then beginning with Moses and the prophets, uh, showed them all that was said in the scriptures concerning himself. And in a sense, in the, in the couple of weeks since then, we have been uh, seeing if he was right, looking at an Old Testament book, the, the book of Daniel, a uh, prophet there, uh, and seeing if we find Christ in these pages. And again and again, we have. Uh, this morning, this famous passage, uh, I want us to see if the, true is, uh, the same isn't true again. Uh, three headings uh, for us as we think this through. Here's the first. Uh, I want us to see initially the intense pressure of pluralism. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was quite some king. Um, the, the ruler of a, a vast superpower, a huge empire, an immensely powerful ruler. Uh, and at the beginning of this chapter, he set up this image this statue. Actually, it's more like an obelisk, um, just three metres wide at the base, uh, towering up some nearly 30 metres in height, like a, like a great needle piercing into the sky. And his instruction is that everyone must bow before it. Uh, when the music plays, uh, people must fall on their faces uh, before his image. It's a symbol of unity, if you like, um, showing that everyone uh, bows before his rule. But uh, notice that Nebuchadnezzar is not refusing um, people's right to their private religion. And people can believe whatever they like in the privacy of their own homes, as it were. Uh, it's just that out in public, uh, before this image, uh, they must conform. Uh, in that way, everyone, I suppose, can get on. You tolerate my beliefs, I'll tolerate yours. Everyone's happy. But of course, it's not quite like that, is it? Because it's not simply saying, make room for my beliefs. No, it's saying, accept my beliefs, share them, hold these two things to be true at the same time. It's classic pluralism. It says, look, there are loads of truths. Uh, there's this truth here, there's that truth there. Just accept that all of them simultaneously uh, are equally true and valid. And then we can all get on. Only the funny thing about this expression of pluralism is that there is actually one thing that you mustn't do, one thing that is forbidden, one thing that is absolutely off limits, and that is to assert that there is some absolute truth. Now that's absolutely out of order. You can see the irony I'm getting at, can't you? In this declaration that there is no absolute truth, there is the absolute truth that there is no absolute truth. It's not a play on words. It's actually really significant. And in our pluralistic culture, you can see how the whole thing is beginning to unravel, how the cracks are beginning to show. Because on the basis of tolerance, all sorts of things are suddenly becoming intolerable. You see it in our universities as student unions are, are refusing people platforms to speak. There are no platforming uh, people whose views they won't accept. Uh, and this isn't on religious matters. Uh, these are, are secular speakers who just don't fit in uh, with uh, the political correctness of the moment. Uh, their opinions are denied. Uh, their voices are censored, even though in many cases what they have to say would have been mainstream uh, a matter of a few years ago. The power of pluralism is huge. The pressure to conform is immense. So just imagine it. Imagine being Shadrach or Meshach or Abednego, standing in the middle of that crowd as the music began to play, and, and around you, person after person, falls on their faces before the image and you go on standing until everybody is down on the ground 
and it's just the three of you, stood there like three sore thumbs, so visible, so obvious, so vulnerable, nowhere to hide. Uh, today it might be uh, the teenager at school who uh, won't muck in uh, with the Ouija board, or the, the colleague at work whose views on sex are just so old-fashioned and everybody uh, leaves them out. Everybody laughs at them either to their face or behind their backs. It is hard to stay standing, isn't it? In the face of pressure like that. And for Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, it's not just that kind of social pressure to fit in with everybody else. There is also the imminent pressure, the imminent threat to life itself. See it there in verse 6. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. And, and you see that in the face of that, how easy to kind of rationalise a decision to, to, uh, to, to fit in with everybody else. You can imagine people would say, couldn't you? Look, look, everyone knows that this statue doesn't mean anything. It's just a lump of gold. So why not just cross your fingers and bow down? God will understand. Or somebody might say, you'd be silly to waste your life. Look, you've been given a position of influence. You could really make a difference in the world. Getting killed won't help anyone. Or don't be so rigid. No one listens to fanatics. Look, just, just be a bit more kind and gentle and, 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 and warm and fuzzy. Be reasonable. Or look, would you stop being so awkward? You're just making it difficult for the rest of us. You get us all into trouble. Just fit in, can't you? Now, there, there are a hundred different ways that you could rationalise the decision that it makes sense just to bow down with everybody else. What would you have done in a crowd of hundreds, a crowd of thousands? Would you have the courage to go on standing? Would I? Just out of obedience to God, just because you know that he's told you never to bow down or worship anything or anyone other than him, would you or I have gone on standing? Well, first, that intense pressure from pluralism. And now, secondly, see the beautiful devotion of their faith. Well, I've said that Nebuchadnezzar was a king with immense power. Um, but he's also portrayed here uh, as a rather comic figure. Uh, you can almost see him with the steam coming out of his ears. As furious with rage, in verse 14, he calls these young men to account. Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? And, and without even giving them a chance to answer, he presses on. Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe and all kinds of music, I think our writer's having a bit of a laugh here. When you hear all of that, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image I've made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? It's not immediately obvious, um, but this chapter actually has um, a very particular structure. Uh, the beginning section and the end section match one another. Uh, they're both royal pronouncements. Um, and then the next sections in kind of match each other. Uh, one is an accusation and the other a vindication. And then the next section's in, uh, they too match each other. They are both royal fury. And then tucked right in the middle of that frame, if you like, is the centrepiece. Which is what? It is this astonishing reply that three young men give to the king. It's there in verse 16. King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, 
We want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. It is an extraordinary answer. What courage, what clarity. We believe our God can do this. There is no question in our minds of his ability. But we're not going to presume. Even though he can, he may choose not to. But even then, even if he chooses not to save us, it doesn't matter. Because we still will remain faithful to him. We still won't worship your image. Because obedience to our God comes first. You see what this means? You see what they're saying here? They're saying, in effect, look, this isn't cupboard love. We don't love and serve God because of what we can get from him. It's not about what he gives us. It is just about him. We do this out of love and devotion for our God. And that is enough. Now, in a sense, we all get this, don't we? Because we know how much we, we hate it when people are just nice to us when they want something from us. And then they ignore us uh, the rest of the time. Now, we hate being treated like that because it just makes us feel, feel as if we're being used. And that's what makes this so, so beautiful, so astonishing. Because here's a love for God that isn't driven by self-interest. It's not shaped by, by them and their desires. No, it's truly and properly focused on him. And we see the rightness of that, the goodness of that. We sense the freedom that comes when you're driven simply out of love and devotion for the object of your worship, for your creator, God. It's what we were made for. But the question is, how do you get it? It may look very beautiful. It may look wonderfully liberating. But, but how do you have that kind of a, a, a love and devotion? What creates it in you? Uh, well, that's the question that we're going to try and ask and answer in a moment. Uh, but before that, we're going to sing a song, which actually gives us some hints of the answer. Uh, and Beth and Josh and Matt are going to lead us as we do that. Uh, if you're able to, why don't you stand as we sing? Well, great to sing together. Um, do take a seat again if you haven't. Uh, we've seen so far uh, in this great story the intense pressure of pluralism uh, and then the, the beautiful devotion of faith. Uh, and we left ourselves with a question, how do you get a faith like that? Where does it come from? Uh, and the third thing we're going to, to look at to, to answer that question is to look at the personal nature of this salvation. We left the story then with the three young men refusing to bow. And we saw how that tips Nebuchadnezzar over the edge into a white-hot fury, such that he demands that the furnace be heated to a similar temperature to the one he's at. White-hot. Th there's a sort of madness to this anger, isn't there? Because um, the much hotter furnace isn't really going to make things worse for them. It's just going to fry them faster. But madness is like that. Uh, you don't think or act rationally. Uh, the thermostat's cranked up. And in they go. Only from this point on, nothing goes according to plan. At first we get that open the oven door and get a bit of blast of hot air in the face moment. Uh, you, you know how that happens. Uh, only this is a little bit more extreme. Because uh, the blast of hot air uh, fries the soldiers to a crisp. Uh, and you begin to see that everything's going the wrong way round. The soldiers who obey the king are the ones who are getting fried. And the three young men? Well, in a moment, the king, from his viewing platform, gazes down and cries out in amazement because he sees astonishing things. First, he sees three figures walking around inside a blazing furnace. Actually, not three, 
he sees four. Uh, you can hear him saying, look, hang on everyone, D didn't we put three in? We did put three in. I remember how many people I executed, didn't I? It was three, wasn't it? Was it three? Yes, your majesty, three it was. Well, then there are four. Why are there four? Who's the fourth? And look at him. He looks like a son of the gods. And over the roar of the flames, Nebuchadnezzar bellows, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. And astonishing, they do. They walk out of the furnace. Well, everyone gathers around. I mean, they would, wouldn't they? Astonished to find that these men are not even singed. Uh, not a whiff of smoke or, or, or soot upon them. And it begs the question, why? Why would you do it like this? Why save in this way? Because you can think of all the other ways that God could have interrupted this process. I don't know, you could have struck the soldiers blind so they'd never have been able to even get the three men into the furnace in the first place. Or, or how about a blazing sword flashing across the entrance to prevent them being thrown in? Or strike Nebuchadnezzar mute in the middle of his proclamation? Or, or why not wind back and stop them ever being taken into exile in the first place? Any of those would have done the trick. But that's not the way that God chooses. Why? Because this is what God does. This is a God who enters in, who comes alongside, who steps right into the horrors and saves us from within. Uh, you notice that opening verse at the very beginning of our service today that David read for us from Isaiah 200 years before these events in the book of Daniel. When Isaiah said, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. When you pass through waters, I will be with you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. You catch the, the very personal nature of that. I will be with you. And in that sense, uh, when Nebuchadnezzar speaks in verse 29, he speaks better than he knows. Because you see what he says there? He says, no other God can save this way. Now, now think about that for a moment. Think about the way that the other so-called gods, um, how those salvations come about. H how do other religions uh, couch the notion of salvation? It's all essentially the same, isn't it? Um, it's all the notion that if you, if you do the right thing, if you perform the right religious duties, uh, if you do good works, if you keep these rules, then your God will reward you. But uh, do you see how that leaves you so vulnerable to the experience of suffering? Because if you find yourself suffering, one of two things must be true. Either God has let you down, not come good on his side of the bargain. Or you yourself have let God down. You're the one who has failed in the performance of your duties and that's why you're suffering as you are. But on this point, Christian thinking is utterly different. It's not God striking a bargain with us, it is God dispensing grace. Stepping into our suffering. Taking our very place. And the reason that we need never be alone in our suffering is because Jesus Christ was alone in his suffering. On the cross, Jesus entered the, the ultimate furnace for us, endured the very fires of hell itself. And in that moment of suffering, there was no one with him. No ministering angel came to his side. No voice from heaven spoke words of comfort to him. No, the sky was dark and the heavens were silent. And the reason that Christ was alone on the cross in that suffering 
was so that you and I need never be alone in our suffering. And when you see that, when you see a God who loves you enough to do that for you, well, then you love him. And you love him not for what you can get out of him. You, you just love him because he is lovely. Because you see that that kind of a sacrifice, that kind of love for you, that kind of willingness to, to die in your place is lovely, more lovely, more glorious, more beautiful. A greater display of kindness and grace than anything or anyone you've ever known or could know. And you love him for it. You say, I am for this God. Even if the whole world stands against me, I will stand for him. I'm his. He's mine. I will stand for him because he stood in the breach for me. Before this pandemic that we're living through is over, you and I may fall ill. There's no guarantee from God that that won't happen. Before this pandemic is over, you or I might find ourselves in intensive care. There's no promise that God will bar the way. Before this pandemic is over, you or I may be facing death itself. God doesn't promise to spare us from that either. What he has promised is that in any of those things, he will be with us and he will take us through it because he has already borne it for us. I wonder if you've seen this yet. I wonder whether you've understood it, seen it so vividly that you've fallen in love with Christ and he's captured your heart. Maybe not. Maybe you're still working it through. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was. At this point, he may be astonished, but he's not converted. If you want to find out how that happens, then you need to come back next week as we look at chapter 5. Uh, let me, uh, chapter 4 in fact, <laughs> let me lead us in a prayer as we finish. Our Father God, uh, this chapter uh, speaks to us of your extraordinary work uh, in stepping uh, into uh, the very furnace uh, to be with us in our suffering, uh, to take our place even uh, in uh, the judgment that we deserve uh, so that we could be saved, we could be yours. Uh, Lord God, would you help us to, to see more clearly all that Christ has done uh, so that we might love him as we should and that that love uh, would transform us uh, to people who are bold, uh, wonderfully single-minded uh, in our love and devotion to you, uh, the thing for which we were made. Uh, and we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. So if children have been nearby uh, getting on with other activities, now would be a great time uh, for us to gather together as we come to the end of uh, our time online uh, and we're going to sing uh, a final hymn. Uh, so let's stand, sing together. <laughs>